Russia's defense ministry earlier on saying that the Israeli military holds full responsibility for the downing of that Russian military aircraft in Syria earlier this week that killed all 15 servicemen on board. In a statement to the media, the Russian military presented a detailed timeline of the incident, in concluding that the actions of the Israeli Air Force did lead to the tragedy. Israel had previously blamed the downing on Syria, Iran and Hezbollah. Our senior correspondent, Murad Gazdiev, next looks at how it could affect relations uh, forthcoming between Russia and Israel, especially considering their previous history. Whatever side you ask, no one's guilty, culpable or liable. Everyone blames someone else. Israel holds the Assad regime, whose military shot down the Russian plane, fully responsible for this incident. Israel also holds Iran and the Hezbollah terrorist organization accountable for this unfortunate incident. This regrettable incident is the result of the usual Israeli impudence and rowdiness, who always use the filthiest means to achieve their unsavory goals and enact their hostility in our region. Was it the Syrians who launched the missile while fending off a surprise air raid on their country? Was it the Iranians? Hezbollah, who apparently had an arms factory that just had to be bombed? Or was it the Israelis, who reportedly hid behind Russian aircraft? The presented objective data testify that the actions of Israeli fighter pilots, which led to the loss of life of 15 Russian servicemen, either lacked professionalism or were an act of criminal negligence, to say the least. Russia holds Israel responsible. That is clear. And Israel's excuses have been dismissed as just that, excuses. The Israeli regime put uh, the Russian servicemen at risk intentionally in order to be able to carry out this uh, attack on, on Syria, which is, of course, illegal in itself. The arrogance of Netanyahu has caused him great difficulty now because he has to be answerable to the uh, Russian people. And instead of uh, apologizing, as usual, the Israelis are looking for scapegoats. Israel insists it had to bomb the Iranians, Hezbollah, there and then. Yet, how many times has Israel now had to bomb Syria? Dozens and dozens, monthly, to stop Iranian and Shia aggression, it says. How many times has Iran attacked Israel? And this puts Russia in a tough spot. Its trademark selling point of being friends with everyone may be impossible to keep up. Russia is now quite even-handed in the Middle East, and it tries to keep good relations with all the parties, with Israel, with the Arabs, with the Palestinians, with Turkey, with Iran. I wonder how long will it last that you can be a friend of everybody because by the end of the day, we are dealing with a very fragile reality in the Middle East with very contradicting powers and a lot of atrocity, as we know, and violence. But Russia thought it could manage. And why not? Look at all it has done for Israel. When Russia flew near the Israeli-occupied Golan Heights, they warned them 310 times they notified Israel. When Israel bombed Syria, Russia never shot down Israeli jets or missiles, even when they posed a danger to Russian personnel. At Israel's request, Russia tore up a deal to sell Syria S-300 air defense systems, which would have made Israeli air raids much more difficult. Israel expressed its concerns as soon as the S-300 deal with Syria was signed. Israel concluded that with these new air defense systems, Syria would have been able to cover all of Israel's airspace. That means that Damascus could have shot down Israeli military planes just seconds after takeoff. The Israelis said they could not let that happen. They expressed their alarm and asked Moscow to break the deal. Russia has answered Israel's concerns by first suspending the contract and then withdrawing from it completely and returning $400 million that it had already received from the Syrian government. Russia helped broker a deal to keep Iranian and Hezbollah forces in Syria away from the Golan Heights, from the Israeli border, at Israel's request. 
in Golan Heights, the Russian military, at Israel's request, launched a special operation to identify and exhume the remains of Israeli soldiers dead for decades. And Russia got UN troops back to the Golan Heights after six years. At the request of Israel, with the assistance of the Russian force, all Iran-backed formations with heavy weapons were withdrawn from the Golan Heights to a safe distance for Israel, more than 140 kilometers to the east of Syria. In 2016, at the urgent request of the chief of the general staff of the Israel Defense Forces, Israel received the Magach 3 tank, captured in 1982 in Lebanon and kept in Russia ever since. And then there's the diplomatic cover Russia's given Israel by backing it up in the UN Security Council or by protecting Israel from Obama's parting shots. Russia has been helping Israel a lot. Moscow has always taken Israeli interest into account, especially when it comes to the Middle East settlement. For example, in 2016, the outgoing Obama administration tried to push the draft resolution on the Israeli-Palestinian settlement at the UN Security Council. That resolution would have adopted artificial circumstances for the settlement, which were unacceptable for Israel. Russia took Israel's concerns into account. And despite then US Secretary of State John Kerry bombarding Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov with requests to vote in favor of it, Russia didn't do it. Moscow helped Israel in that case, so the resolution didn't pass. You'd have thought Israel would be grateful, or at least appreciate the effort. But 15 Russian servicemen are now dead, killed in the crossfire of Israel's preemptive vendettas, which means one of two things. Either the Israeli government has no care at all for all that Russia has done, or that the Israeli military leads a very separate life. The director of a think tank that focuses on the Middle East told us earlier it's clear from the timeline now why Moscow is pointing the finger at Israel. They say it was deliberate that the Israeli pilots chose to take refuge in, um, in a plane or around a plane with a large or a much larger footprint on the radar screens, i.e. the IL or the Illusion 20. Um, he says that this was deliberate. Now, it's not clear, and I don't think anybody can go as far as determining the intentions of the Israeli um, uh, pilots, i.e., did they took refuge in this plane so that the Syrians don't shoot, or they took refuge in the plane, uh, in this plane, so that the uh, Syrians if they shoot, it would be shot down. There is a fine line between the two analogies. This is why he said this is a close to criminal uh, um, negligence, uh, you know, at, at one end and great unprofessionalism in, in one end. So what is happening is that had it not, not only been for the operation, but also for the actions of the Israeli um, airplanes and the misleading of the th uh, regarding the theater of operations, none of this would have happened. So it's clear for, the, for Moscow that Israel is to blame. Now, how or where Moscow goes from there is, is what remains to be seen.